I just want to once again thank all of you for spending your Friday with us. I hope that it was really meaningful for you. That's always our goal is to make sure you walk away not saying that that was a day wasted. <laughs> so um, this is really important, and I and I hope that you did. If you have any questions, if you want to meet with anybody, if there's anybody you want to connect with, all you need to do is reach out to us next week, uh, preferably on Tuesday, and. Uh, and let us know, and we will do our very best to connect you. One thing that we also do that we don't have time for today, but I do love to offer this to all of our nonprofits. If there's something you need that is not a board member or money, and you want to float it around, let us know, because we will ruminate it with this group. You do not know who's in this room and what resources that they have. So Tommy's doing all the selfies. Um, so let me introduce you the Selfie King. Uh, nonprofit sector connector and uh go and hr division with vanguard benefits your very own if you don't know him i don't know how you don't but you're gonna know him because he's a big deal he is a big deal kind of, it's kind of a big of deal around here uh tommy denise thank you thank you thank you very much um thank you allison thank you uh kelly and serini Thank you to the other founders of the Nonprofit Resource Hub, Ed Probst, Frank Orzo, Christine Desca, David, uh, David Goldstein from Sir Tillman Ballin, and Ken Serini, Serini and Associates. Thank you to the panels that we've had here before. Thank you to our guests, I, excuse me, our hosts. I was just talking to Mr. French. I'm always going to play. No matter how long we've become French. friends, I'm, I'm going to call you Mr. French from now on. <laughs> but what an awesome opportunity it is spend time in the nonprofit sector. I say this all the time. I was on a meeting yesterday um, and I said, you know, we could have decided to, I don't know what that's waving, louder? <clears throat> okay. <laughs> we could have decided to work in venture capital. We could have decided to work in the hedge fund space. We all decided to spend time in the nonprofit sector and that's incredibly important. So I just want to say hi to my business partner, Ed Probst over there, Vanguard Benefits. <laughs> And the reason I, I shout out Ed, not just because he's my, my partner and my buddy, but also because we had a vision seven or eight years ago, and we said, who do we want to work with? Who do we want to spend the time with? And we decided it was nonprofit organizations. And then I nicknamed myself the Nonprofit Sector Connector. I started hosting a show called Philanthropy and Focus. If you don't know about that, it's a great program. I tell you that because I do it, and that's important. But it's great because it's not about me. It's about my guest. It's about their organization. It's about the work that they do because they're on the front lines. They're leaders of nonprofit organizations. And we have four incredible leaders up here with me today. And I say this on the show. I say the show is all about helping these nonprofits tell their story and amplify their message. And I'm dramatic when I say that because it's really critically important. So yes, I, Allison just asked a question. If you're not looking for money or board members, if there's other things you need, other resources, reach out to the nonprofit resource hub. Certainly that's what it's there for. But I think from our theme from the beginning of the day with the ask through the other panels about collaboration, I think what it's all about is making new friends. And if you saw it during the break, if I found you seated alone, <laughs> if i found you seated alone i didn't allow that to go on for such a long time because god the, the opportunities that can come out we were just talking before right just you meet somebody you learn something new about somebody what can come out of that what's the ripple effect i would argue well it's infinite because it really is it's who do you know how can those relationships grow yesterday morning i was at book fairies right shout out book fairies I was at book fairies and because somebody said, Tommy D, we have all these books and we'd love to get them to book fairies. And I had to get out there. And after that, I picked up some diapers um, <laughs> from Allied Foundation and brought them to another organization. And that's not about me. It's about telling the stories of these organizations. We're going to talk about stories. So I'm going to stop talking for a little while. And other <laughs> people talk. Um, it was just one more point I wanted to make. And it was just something Christine Desk has said. <clears throat> My buddy, my collaborator, Christine Desk, and nonprofit sector strategies. What is your why? Let's consider that as we frame this conversation today. What is your why? Why do you get up every morning and do what you do? Think about that. And we'll talk about that with my guests. All right, here's what we're going to do we're going to go right down the line and we're going to have each person introduce themselves about two or three minutes about your background. We're going to pretend like this is the lightning round of philanthropy and focus. Right? Usually we have an hour to do this. Now you got two minutes. <laughs> so it's definitely, I always wanted to be a game show host. Yeah. My whole life. 
probably shocks most Great. people here. Now we get to... <laughs> so I, I got to remind myself, it's not about, it's not a Tommy D performance right now. This is about everybody else. So I want you to talk about you, your background, and your organization. I will kind of delicately stop you if it's going too long, <laughs> and that's how we'll do it. Why don't we start, start off with Suzette, please introduce yourself, and then we'll write over to Patrick. Thank you so much, and um, hello, colleagues. Um, so my name is Suzette Gordon. Um, I'm the president and CEO of SEO Family of Services. Um, and a little bit about SEO. We are one of the largest human services agencies in the New York metro area. Our budget is about $260 million. We have about 3,000 employees. Um, and our amazing, amazing employees deliver services to about 50,000 New Yorkers every year um, in six core service areas. Our continuum, I'll tell you very briefly, include education and early childhood, homeless services, services for individuals with developmental disabilities, uh, community health and wellness, family permanency and support, residential and juvenile justice. I think I got all six. Um, and my path to, the, to sit at the helm of this incredible organization is a rather unique one. Uh, I'm a lawyer, do not hold that against me. Um, I've been an attorney for about 22 years um, and I joined SEO in 2019 as its first general counsel um, and was fortunate enough to just go up the chain and um, land the job, this job in July. Um, my why is that I want to be a person who can make a difference in the world. I want to do something that's impactful. When I went to law school, I started out working for a big firm, and that was pretty cool, but it didn't really make me happy. Um, and very early in my career, I had to have a real conversation with myself about what I wanted my life to be and look like. And once that clicked and I got a clarity around my values, um, then I started aligning myself with mission-driven organizations, and government and my career has spanned uh, through that uh, vein. So I'm really excited to be here, to hear more about your stories, to talk with you, but that's a little bit about me. That's incredible. We're going to go to, to Patrick in a second, but I want to just frame this. You can do anything in this sector. You don't just have to be a development person, right? So consider that. And I say that to people who might be listening elsewhere, seeing this sometime in the future. So we're going to talk, we're in a, we're in a university right now. People don't want to go into work in this sector and they can go from the legal field, from finance, all different disciplines. Patrick, please take it away from a social enterprise perspective, right? Yeah. yeah. So um, the astute of you will pick up quickly. I'm not from Farmingdale or. or... <laughs> I did live in Queens for a while. And uh, my joke was that I was from the land of the queen, but now we have a king. Uh, so it's very confusing. Uh, I'm from the United Kingdom. I came over to work at a special needs summer camp when I was 18 years old, um, got placed at upstate New York and as a camp counselor, no experience, no interaction with the autism population. And um, I had this amazing experience, amazing summer. And, and there was a, one conversation at the end of the summer with a parent who um, that changed probably the whole direction of my life. Cause uh, you know, you always ask a pickup day, what happens next? You know, where are they going? Like, you know, they go back to school, whatever. And this one family that I spoke to, didn't have a next, they didn't have a plan. Their, their child, their son um, had graduated and was basically falling off the service cliff, as we say. And, you know, tears kind of filled up in their eyes and, and they talked about how, you know, their fear of getting older and their fear of um, not being able to take care of their child and, and it led to them saying that they just wanted to live one day longer. That was their wish. And, and that is just such an unnatural feeling uh, for a parent to have to want to live one day longer. and and do that. So that was it for me. And I was like, okay, I'm 18 years old. I'm going to finish my undergraduate in the UK, come back and, and, um, and try and help answer that in some way, shape or form. Um, the development disability population face is one of the highest unemployment rates in the country. It's about 80% and 67% in New York state. And so employment was the one that we thought let's, let's tackle that. Um, and so with my two co-founders who are both parents of uh, now adults on the autism spectrum, but when we started 13 years ago with teenagers, Started Spectrum Designs, uh, which is a custom printing business, mostly T-shirts, merchandise, swag, whatever people like to call it. Uh, and 60% of our workforce are on the autism spectrum. Um, we're now at, we started in a backyard barn in 2011. We're now, uh, we have uh, almost 80 employees. 
uh, 45 are on the spectrum. So it's about 60% of our workforce printing for Google and Uber and big companies and corporations, as well as many of the nonprofits in this room. We really believe in collaborating and working together. Uh, thank you. And um, yeah, it's just great to be in a room like this where everyone is learning from each other, sharing best practices. And, and, and I know we're going to get to it, but yeah. like there's so much overlap. There's so much overlap oh, yeah. with what we're all doing. And, you know, people with disabilities face high rates of unemployment. That means poverty. That means incarceration. That means uh, food insecurity, housing insecurity. And so we can all get in our own lanes and realize actually there's a much broader picture there oh my god this is so uh, we need three more hours can we get three more hours <laughs> i don't know how that that's work that's that that's incredible there's so much there i have 90 questions well Sorry. you got to come on philanthropy and focus we'll work through that over okay. there um but think about it it's a figment of somebody's imagination and now there's 80 people employed 60 percent of those people have some sort of intellectual development disability or autism specifically game changing changing the world Minerva, please, followed by Dan. Thank you. I'm um, happy to be here. Really proud to be sitting uh, among you. And uh, so my name is Minerva Perez. I'm the executive director of OLA of Eastern Long Island, which stands for Organización Latino Americana. Um, it is a Latino-focused organization historically, um, started about two, about 21 years ago, and uh, on the east end of Long Island. So we're covering uh, the five east end towns, the, uh, the hamlets and the villages in between, which is uh, just a whole other land unto itself, it's another universe unto itself, in that the silos are beautiful if they work really well and, and not so easy if they don't. That's 10 police departments, that is 10 court systems, that is 24 school districts that are very individual school districts. Um, and again, it can be beautiful sometimes, uh, but it does mean that you talk about relationship building and how critical that is to the work that you do. It is the most critical piece of what we do on the east end of Long Island with OLA. Our work has expanded out beyond a Latino focus uh, because we've been here long enough and watching the growth of our east end to understand where our skill sets are and what else we can bring to the table to answer and bring solutions to uh, considerations and challenges that have not been brought. Uh, one major one being adolescent mental health. So we right now are running the only uh, adolescent mental health initiative of its kind uh, across the East End. We'd like it to be scalable, but we'll see what happens. Uh, and that is going into the school systems, classroom by classroom, uh, in English and Spanish, uh, and sometimes breaking out just the ENL, the English as a new language, uh, students from middle school all the way to high school, classroom by classroom on topics related to mental and emotional health uh, in terms of mitigating the problems that some of the students are having. Uh, and also we run a helpline from 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. seven days a week. And we answer those texts, mainly texts and English and Spanish. Um, nothing like this exists at a local context. A national text line is something, but it's very different when you have what we do. And then when we have certain needs that we can throw over to the rest of the organization. So that's Youth Connect within OLA. Um, so we continue out whatever that family might be needing, we can do a lot more than just be texting them. Uh, my background is actually theater. So um, I sit before you as a graduate of NYU's Tisch School of the Arts, uh, Strasbourg. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, Strasbourg, um, Cass and NYU Law. Oh, my gosh, wonderful, wonderful. Um, so we, uh, I gotta say the background that I've had has prepared me for more than anything has been my theater background. After graduating NYU, I toyed with some LSATs. Eh. Uh, <laughs> still have it in my head somewhere, uh, but uh, ended up starting a theater company. But all the kind of the skill sets, the ethics, the way you work with people, the way you build teams, the way you handle problems, the way you pivot on a dime, the way you do everything with no money. Um, all these kinds of things uh, have really prepared me for some of the work I've done. And before for this, I was a director of a domestic violence shelter for about six years on the east end of Long Island, 24-hour crisis shelter. So I'm thrilled with the growth of this particular organization, and we've got a long way to go, but I'm excited to talk more about it. Awesome. Thank you for being here. This is some panel, man. Right? Yeah. The four of us could maybe make like a play or a musical. <laughs> and take the five of us. The four of you, I'll just, I'll just, I, I don't have any wit we'll right Drive the bus. All right, let's go to Dan Lloyd from, we have supposed to have met a couple of different times, yeah. and we only met just now in the cafeteria. Yeah, so yeah. I'm glad to have met you. Can you tell us about your organization, the mission you're on? Absolutely. It was, uh, it's an honor to be here with everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Lloyd, and I'm actually from right here at Wine Dance. I grew up in Wine Dance, Dan also in North Amityville. So this is like literally my backyard. I grew up in, it's in my blood, um, but unfortunately, my, my parents had a nonprofit for 30 years. I wanted nothing to do with it. <laughs> I never liked the word nonprofit. It just never made sense to me growing up. Um, but I, I also saw them struggle, to be honest with you. They, they did it full time, and it was a passion for them. They had an organization called Long Island Citizens for Community Values. Um, 
So I saw a lot of the ups and downs in the journey as a child. And, and again, it just didn't make sense. My dream was to be a record executive. I was doing very yeah. well in my 20s. I was on my way, planned to move to California. And some things happened personally. At 30 years old, I moved back to live with my parents. And I just started volunteering with them a bit. And this is in 2016. And I kind of caught the bug of what they were doing. And at the time, it was digital safety. So I was giving them all these ideas. We raised some, some good money. So I, I realized I was pretty good at having a passion for a mission and raising money. Um, as I said, I grew up in Wyandanche. I was privileged to understand the political process on a local end. I was also privileged to go to very good schools in Long Island. A lot of my colleagues and a lot of my friends did not. So I understood what was happening on a local level. And when I would have a conversations, I realized there was no civic participation. Uh, civic engagement or no interest at all. Um, and I felt like there was a huge disconnect between the access to power. And that's why we started Minority Millennials in 2017 was to bridge the gap between policy and culture. I'm a political junkie. I love to show billions and house of cards, all these things. I watch all this stuff um, and wanted to figure out a way to communicate the political process to young people of color that could be more interesting and have more of an appetite. So since 2016, our mission is to help young people of color access jobs, build wealth, and become civically engaged. We do a number of civic workshops um, through Nassau and Suffolk. At first, we just started in Suffolk. Now we have over 200 Gen Z members in Nassau. So we are a Long Island regional organization. A large part of our work now is workforce development. So we do a lot of recruitment for public and private institutions, specifically building diverse talent pipelines into clean energy, uh, financial careers, and as well as pre-apprenticeships, so construction and trades. Thank you. This is great. So, all right, here's how we're going to handle the rest of this. I really want to hear from you because I want to talk about connection collaborating. So I want to hear the questions from you. So I'm going to zip through when I'm the questions that I was given, and uh, we're going to get to the audience as soon as possible because I know you want to connect. And um, if you if you saw me during the break, the lunch break, I was trying to make you all connect, but maybe you didn't miss, maybe you didn't trade cards with everybody. So I know this will give you a good opportunity to do so. So let's do this. Let's kind of in rapid fire. Um, I'm thinking of a number from one to ten. Minerva, pick a number. Five. No. <laughs> six, that's my birthday, January 6th. All right. Um, it's always six. Whenever I ask you for a number between one and ten, it's always six. All, every single time. So it's not a, so good job, Patrick. Um, now you all know. <laughs> kind of blew that game. All right. Well, so let's do this rapid fire. We'll start over here, Patrick, and then we're just going to go. I want to, what skills are most important to, to future leaders to possess? to really grow a successful nonprofit organization. I think we had some prep on this, so you might have the answers, but you don't even need to expand on it too much because the words have so much meaning in themselves. So what what, what are those aspects or characteristics? Yeah, I think I think there's obviously, that's a, a massive question, yeah. but if we're gonna, I know you had said, Tommy, that you wanted this to be more personal. Yes. And uh, I think, you know, from a leadership point of view, it's the most personal, one of the most personal things you can do um, because you're putting yourself out there as a as a human being uh, with a team that's being, you know, you're leading, and so um, I think you know those skills are for me anyway. It's been knowing what I don't know, and so and 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 getting out of my own way in that sense, right? Because leaders sometimes there's this pressure or this expectation that you have to know everything or have all the answers, and there's so much power in being able to be like, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know, and I'll get back to you, right? Or yeah. well, do you know? You know, and so one of the things I joke is that like I know I, I knew I needed like a COO and someone because I'm not very good on Excel. Uh, it's like a really simple example, but it's like not great with numbers, not great at Excel. So I'm going to have to get that practical help. So that's kind of like the, the practical example of, I think, what a leader needs to Humility, to ability to learn, just yeah. being open that. Yeah. I don't have all the answers. Right. Yeah. I, I find as I get older, I realize I can say that more and more. Yeah. Because as younger people, you think I'm supposed to know it all. Right. Realizing I don't know much at all of anything. Right. And that's, but if you put people around you who do know things, we continue exactly. to learn. Whenever I was rude when you got the answer wrong. So why don't you go next? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm just looking. This is my cheat sheet here. Oh, all right. Just look. Just looking at my. Don't come back to you. Pick another uh, number. No, no, no. I'm ready. I'm ready. I mean, there's just there's a lot of them. They're all very important. At it. I mean, I think the collaborative decision maker piece uh, was important, and I and I just kind of link so much of what we do or what I attribute to the, the growth of our organization. Um, like the healthy, the healthy part of our organization is what we're doing with team. 
yeah. you know, so how we bring team into that, how we recognize it, even though we are a Latino focused organization, doesn't mean we just get to hang our hat on, you know, on diversity and say, oh, we got that. Um, there's so many other levels of diversity that we, I'm sure, have not even touched on. And I think sometimes there are blind spots to, to that, assuming that you've got it all because, you know, you've got 90 percent you know, you know, Latino board, or you've got this or that, there's a bunch of stuff there that we don't have. So uh, youth voices are another piece of what, in terms of, we have a lot of work that we're expanding out with uh, adolescent mental health and very critical to us is kind of making sure that youth voices are there with us at the table and have a lot of power behind them. Um, there are other boards that I'm on. I'm on the board of Sac Harbor Cinema, I'm on the board of LTV, I'm on uh, different whatever committees and whatnot. And over and over and over again, I don't see youth anywhere. And I know it's hard. I know it's really hard to get them there. I do. And sometimes it might be that there's a subcommittee, but in terms of actually having a voice that has some weight and strength to it um, is really important. Uh, so the collaborative approach to how we work with our team, how we collaborate with our community at this very moment, we have over 47 collaborations happening just at this very moment. Wow. And that's not even all of them. Um, and a wide spectrum of uh, people in industry in different backgrounds. Um, and it's important that we have that. And this is work. So it's work because you're Build constantly listening, you're building right. relationships, you're understanding, you know, honest, uh, sort of honest expectations that you have. You can't just collaborate with everyone, uh, but understand what those expectations are and what you're bringing to the table for each other, for everyone to be successful um, is very important. So I think the collaborative piece. The collaborative feature, and I heard youth. Does everybody here have a youth board? Like, it, can I have a hand raise? If you lead an organization and work for a nonprofit organization, raise your hands. That's a lot. There we go. That's good. If you sit on a board, you can raise your hand too. Here's the thing. Thank you, Ali. Um, do you find that you have young people involved in the work you're doing? No. Okay. Anybody, some success? Fire me. Give me an answer. What, what's been this? Right, well, right there in the red and the, or maroon. And then. So we have an associate's board and it's... Um, Primarily, we, we first called it the Young Professionals Board. Right. It's primarily people who are 35 and under. Uh -huh. um, they are tasked with a single thing, which is to have some sort of special event that raises awareness about what we do and a small amount of money for what we Got do. It. Yep. Um, and that board, members of that board, when they become really engaged and really show what they're what they're doing, they have made their way to our regular board of directors. The old people board? <laughs> <laughs> okay. They're right the board of directors. And so right now we have on our 19 member board, we have five members who are under five members who are under 35 okay. and probably three of them are under 30. That's awesome. On your uh, quote unquote regular board. They, they So what is the name of your organization and who are you? So it's Hearts Homes Furnishings and we provide uh, 80 essential furnishings for the first department of young adults who age out of foster care and SEO. <laughs> I was one of my like, collaboration. That's awesome. I, I almost, I got very emotional. I had just learned, I had an, a gentleman on my show. His name is Rob Shear runs an organization for comfort cases. You know them? Know. If you ever need a connection to Rob Shear, I can hook you up. They send out these cases. 70% of people on death row came out of the foster care system. Wow. 70%. Wow. 70 what are the statistics? What are we not doing for these young people? I, I didn't move out of my parents' house the last 28, and I'm still not prepared, and I have four kids. But <laughs> the, the thing about it is, imagine that, you know, 18 years old, now you got to go figure it out. So that, anyway, well, I'd love to connect. You had a quick point in front. No, I'm going to steal her idea. Okay. No, we don't have success with the young boards. You don't have success. I have one person probably under 35. What's your name? Joanna Forman. Where are you from? Sibs Place. So Sibs Place. With children that have a level with cancer uh -huh. or another illness. So we provide mental health support for the well child and family. Can you two please exchange business cards and make, make a new friend? Because that's what this is about. Very good. Thank you. Whatever, right back. I, I just want to say, with yeah. the youth like work that we're doing with mental health, how important it is. We, we actually, so we've got always a middle schooler and always a high schooler that we pay for every semester. So every semester we roll off and then roll on a new middle schooler and high schooler. It's very specific to the work that we're doing with mental and emotional health, yeah. but it's important that we stay that uh, connected and that we also are paying them for their time. That's critically important, what Minerva said, right? Interns like, ah, well, I'm going to go volunteer. Maybe I get some college credit. No, there's empowerment to being paid for my time and what I've committed to the impact of the organization, right? Really important. You make sure you're connecting with everybody later on. I don't know if, if I use any word. Somebody said, uh, wasn't there this morning or speaker this morning? I think she said, absolutely, Laura said. And 
connected. I use it all. It's almost cliche in what I do with so much. Let's go to uh, let's go to Dan. Same kind of thing. What's important for a leader to be successful in this space right now? Uh, most of the time when I'm responding today is going to be from the concept of a grassroots organization. So what I mean by that is financially. Starting from zero to where we are now. So in 2018, our 990 postcard was $25. <laughs> Going, I'm serious. But I, I know. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I just like 2023 is going to be a little over half a million dollars. So I want to put four years? No, I think that's six. But but everything, Five. everything, right? We plant the seed. You know this old joke they say, when's the best time to plant the tree? Yeah. 20 years ago. You know when the second best time is? Today. Today. Yeah. And that's what I it just is. Heard that somewhere. Yeah. You know, it's right here. I just said it. <laughs> <laughs> so so grassroots, but I mean, see, you can look at it, you can tell us a different perspective. Yeah. Then Suzette's gonna tell us at an organization that I wrote down 260 million. That's a little more, right? Yeah. So so from that grassroots, what does that look like through your lens? Yeah, so I say that because to me, there's three things. The first was definitely focus. Um, one, because we're just in a digitally age, so you're just getting distracted all day, every day. And two, this wasn't my full-time job um, until half of this year. So I'm constantly doing other things, side jobs, helping with construction, helping my parents, um, doing some consulting work. So you have to focus between what your mission is for the organization and also focus on sustaining life. I also have two kids. I have one at the time and a wife. So focus without a doubt, but also focusing on what your vision is. As you start communicating, which is the second thing, you might start getting a lot of naysayers, a lot of negative feedback, or why do this? Don't recreate the wheel. Staying focused to what your vision and your passion is for the organization is incredibly important um, because I've seen a lot of individuals just kind of like drop the ball after two or three years because there's, there's nothing moving. So focus. The second is absolutely communication. Um, everyone here knows that when you send a proposal for any type of funding, it's the most efficient communication possible. They're gonna ask you a thousand questions. What is this for? What is it going to? What do you do? This, that, and the third. So being able to communicate your story, but also your mission and what the funding will go to is essential to uh, actually creating an, an, a sustainable organization for years to come. The third is hustle. But when I say hustle, I mean hustle and goodwill. So I'm an entrepreneur. I've been for quite some time. And people always tell me, I see you there. I see you this place. Like my wife always tells me, why do you got to go here tonight? Why do you got to go there? <laughs> and but it, honestly, it's hustling. It's hustling the goodwill of what I believe in and, and the mission of civic education, getting young people engaged in the political process, getting young people on boards is something that we've been able to do in the past couple of years. Um, getting young people in positions of power to help shape the future of Long Island. So literally hustling goodwill because good karma comes back on that and people respect that. The last thing I would say is integrity. We are in a nonprofit sector, so it can get a little dicey with when you're fundraising or just trying to get things done. Um, so people can read through a fake individual. People can read through someone that's just hustling them to do something. So absolutely integrity. And that could, people can read through from a philanthropist to Gen Z. I mean, there's been time, we have a Gen Z board and we have a, a Gen Z director. And sometimes I'll say things and they'll just look at me like, ah, I'm, I'm a little off. And that's why I hired a Gen Z director. I'm 37. I'm trying to speak to 16 year olds like I'm still cool. And I, and I, I thought I was, but I, I pretty cool, but I'm older than you. I, uh, but I realized quickly I wasn't. And so we brought in younger people to start communicating directly to, 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 to that demographic. So I want to talk to you about representation on the board and things like that in a second. I want to just hold it there because I want to go to Suzette on the same question. But I want to come back to that because I had written it down this morning or this, some point today about representation on boards and what that looks like because you know i will get into it after we'll go back to it suzette same kind of thing what let me read the question again because we're way far from it right now um what skills are most important to future leaders to possess in order to run and grow a successful organization yeah and i think a lot of what the other panelists said i definitely resonates with me um i would highlight um the passion about the mission um, which I think goes hand in hand with um, strategic thinking. Um, you're going to be having a lot of decision points as a leader um, in any given day at any given time. Um, it's really important to have that big zoomed out view in mind so you're not pulled in all these other directions and what you're doing is aligned with what your organization's supposed to be doing, what your strategic plan calls for, what your focus is. Um, but I also think another thing that I would highlight is to not sweat the small stuff and to be pretty like adaptable um, because um, I always go into the day 
with a plan, but my day never goes the way that I planned it. I, I start my day. Um, I usually, I have a big whiteboard. I write three things that I want to do that day. That's how I measure success. Um, I'm lucky if I get through one of them because there's a crisis or some other thing that's happened that steers you in a, in a different direction. So I think it's really important um, also to get good people around you and trust them and not, um, there can be a temptation as a leader because you get to, I remember when I was, um, a baby lawyer and I was working uh, working uh, in a law firm, the way they staff it is a partner, the mid the, the mid year attorney, the baby lawyer. And I remember um, I got an assignment from a senior attorney who it was her first time giving an assignment. Um, and, um, you know, there's a lot of joy that comes in that and she'll, they'll be like, this is the way you do it because I now get to say how you do it. Um, as a leader, there can be that temptation of, I know better, do it my way. But if you're not making something better or moving the needle, how about empowering your staff and trusting their decisions and judgment and let them do the thing? Um, if your staff can do something, you should not be doing it as a CEO. Mm -hmm. Anything that anybody else can do, that's not your job. Um, your job really is to understand what the organization's mission is, to steer it, to keep it aligned. And really, if you can along the way, um, empower some people to become leaders of their own. I think that that's very important. That's so, that's great because like we want to, like if if there's like a problem somewhere, we want to get right in and fix it, but that's not, you know, you've got a big organization. You have a lot of people, right? And and not only is it, it's not really sustainable to be doing all these different things. It's also not, it's disempowering to the people around us, right? And eventually, I'm sorry to break this on you. We're not all going to be here someday. <laughs> There's got to be the team that we're pulling through, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I, something that Dan said, I, I just want to bring up, and I, because of the way I run things, it might be a little unorthodox. I'm just going to call out people in the room for what I, they've done in my world. And, you know, you mentioned sometimes about the focus on the vision and I got to hustle and I got to, you know, I got a family and all this kind of stuff. Um, I've met some of the most incredible impressive leaders in the nonprofit sector and they look out for each other. And I'm staring right at you because I'm talking about you, Eileen, because you've done so much for me. I leave it over from book fairies. Okay. Shut, do this. Here, here's why. And here, here's why. And because it's I'm up here, I get to do this. Here's the thing about it. It's all about being in community with other leaders. And Eileen has gone way beyond with all these, I come up with things I'm like, look, I need to jump on this call and teach somebody else, another executive director, how to do Salesforce. And like, She's there. And it's about that. So my point of bringing it and making that a thing in the room is look around the room and make connections, be in community with other leaders. I know they say sometimes it gets lonely at the top. You look around, you can't always tell your staff that, although we said, I don't know. And I love that. Not over, not all the time can we say that, right? We, we, but we can talk to our other teammates in the Long Island community, let's say, but really generally all over the place, right? So do you all agree with that? I see the heads nodding, so I guess we'll good. It's important. All right. So, oh, and and do the recognition piece when you can. So, um, I'm going to move around to a different question really quick. That support or resources that you believe have been very effective for your your organizations um, could be resource groups that you're a part of. It could be websites that you utilize. It could be like what I just did right there in the room, calling out a friend who's done great things. So. Um, I'd encourage everybody to jot down notes when this comes up because and when, I'm assuming we have some mechanism to share this information, right? Yes. So, Suzette, let's start back. Oh, wow. Already? No, okay. we skip. Um, no, 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 Resources. Um, I'll take a little bit of a, a different spin on it um, because my organization is so large. Um, you know, you have six program areas and then an admin side and a lot of different silos. So for me, some of those resources are really internal. Um, part of the culture that I'm trying to build is our model is that we're delivering services to people who are vulnerable. And so everyone has to buy into that, that that's their role to support that mission. No matter where you are in the organization. If you're in right? legal, that's what yeah. your job is. If you're in IT, that's what your job is. And Historically, what um, used to happen is, you know, decision points would be made. And, and I'm sure this resonates with you. There's always a thing with program and admin um, in the organization. Sales and service. In the yes, exactly. Exactly. And so 
historically decisions might be made on the administrative side and then it doesn't serve the program. Right. And a lot of times it's because people never talked to each other. Not, about 90% of the problems that people elevate to me, like immediately I see that what happened is somebody didn't talk to somebody. And it's, it's amazing. Like just have a conversation and I'll say, did you talk to this person? And they're like, no, but I could. All right, well then try that. Um, so for me, in terms of resources, it's how internally in my organization, I am encouraging people to work together as a team and to remember that why that how do you start it with. Like, is, it, is it team days? I model it. Um, so um, I do it in a variety of ways. So I personally uh, make time um, very regularly for my direct reports. And I also do skip down meetings with the people who report to them because I think it's very important for me to get the information unfiltered um, from the people who I consider to be leaders of the organization. I also hold uh, quarterly town halls where any employee can get to come and ask me and the leadership team questions. I also model sharing information and having sort of a communication mechanism where there's a decision point. It's not perfect. I'm trying to model it. Uh, but the, my, my vision is before you start to do the thing, get all the people together who might be impacted and talk to them. Because I'll give you a quick example. Um, you know, IT um, made a decision to invest in um, a swiping tool um, for our direct care staff that um, didn't really serve them. It, it, it wasn't going to work, but they never asked the program, how is this thing that we're buying going to affect you? So they, they didn't check in with the stakeholders. So they did not the, check in with general, the general. That's what exactly. we need. Like, who is going to be affected if we do this thing by this software, invest in this pro, whatever it is, right? Exactly. Even exactly. To, the point to the street level, to the people, to the people we serve, how is this going to affect them? Right? Exactly. So as a leader, it's important that I message how important that is to me, but I can't be like a do as I say, not as, as I right. do. So I have to, you know, intentionally do things in the organization where I'm modeling that and the ripple effect that I'm seeing is people are like, oh, okay, so Suzette's doing this. So my skip down meetings, yeah. now people are like, maybe I should do skip down right. meetings. You know what I mean? So those those types of things. I love that. Has anybody else done that in their organizations? Or Yes? Varika, tell us about it real quick. Who are you? I am the director of advancement at Girl Scouts of Suffolk County. And I, um, I've done the skip level meeting, not here, but in other organizations. And it goes really well to create an openness of communication yeah. to uh, eliminate that barrier of hierarchy. And then also for the people who are higher ups to understand the work that goes on. Right. Below them. You know, it's one thing to have a broad view of what goes on and to make strategic decisions, but to really understand what the work is like helps inform those strategic decisions. So I would recommend it to everyone. I love it. Did, do you know all my panelists, my new friends? I know Suzette. You do? I just met her. At a, she was on a panel and she was brilliant. And yes. I just met her there. I love uh, it. Like a month ago. This is what it's all about. It's I, That's it's a, bit, a bit about connecting, if you haven't heard me. Uh, yeah, how about you? Want to play? Yeah. Let me let me go back to the question. <laughs> um, you know, resources, things that you believe have impact your organization. I mean, you talk about civically minded people. You talk about getting young people involved in the work, getting young people involved in boards. How? What do you use? Um, well, early on, I, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I will just say, I don't know if anyone's heard of Joan Gary. No. Oh, no. Joan Gary. Yeah, yeah. The, yes, I have. Yeah. Amazing. The lab, so, right? Isn't it the nonprofit lab? Is that yes. thing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, honestly, like if you just listen to a podcast, you'll have all the resources and access you need. So I, I really tap into that. Um, as far as for minority millennials here locally is absolutely relationships. Um, and also understanding the times. So we started in 2018, really, and summer of 2020 happened. Yeah. So we were already positioned before that to really take advantage in a good way, in a positive way, to make sure that our demographic- You were more proactive, you, were, you didn't have already, to react. Exactly. Many organizations had to react when that time. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. once that happened, what was everyone talking about in the summer of 2020? DEI, racial equity, uh, public policy, public safety, all of these things that were shifting, we were now able to position our organization for our members in tables of conversation, positions of leadership, um, and funding. So now all these banks are doing racial equity donors and sponsorships. And so really just positioning your organization authentically to be ahead of the times. You know, so we started our organization at the time, I was a minority and millennial. Um, but in 10 years, we're probably going to change the name to reflect more of the next generation and what it reflects. Same mission, but just branding a little differently. So that's great. Yeah, that's great. I, the one, not one, but like a common theme that I continue to hear is relationships and collaboration. Just 
that's the, it's critically important. And I didn't hear anybody say, hey, man, I, I can't work with other nonprofits because we're fighting for the same dollars. That does happen, though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to be honest, uh, especially for a grassroots organization that's focusing on specifically black and brown communities, because the dollar doesn't trickle down the same way for underserved uh, missions. So we're going up against traditionally powerhouses that I'm not going to name any, but that, you know, need the same dollar that we need. And so it can at times be a little difficult to collaborate because the mission might be the same, but the way to get there is different. Mm -hmm. And so there's been times where I've been asked to join a board and then I'm realizing, oh, you're kind of taking my mindset and I can't put that into my organization. It's more going into this powerhouse, but it's not the same end result. So there is a lot of navigating and nuances, oh, but, and also making sure you keep it positive. Now, I've seen a lot of other times where it can get really negative and that doesn't help anybody. So maintaining the relationship, but also maintaining your vision and integrity for your goal. Awesome. Thank you. You want to go first or second? Yeah, I'll point at Minerva. Okay. You want to go first? <laughs> I'll go first. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to say two, two different resources. One is that even before COVID, a lot of the work that we do has been remote. And um, and finding that because we do serve the entire East End, which, you know, it went, if it's a summer, it takes you about seven hours to get from Montauk, um, if you don't take the ferry, uh, around to Greenport. Um, and while you're driving there, you're driving through 10 different police departments, 10 different school districts, you know, you're just, you're just experiencing different things. But the... Um, the ability to be remote is something that we kind of embraced early on because we really wanted our team to be in people's living rooms, in their school districts, in the town halls, in the village halls, in the police departments, in the court systems, everywhere. So that meant that there's no really need for, you know, having everyone be at this hub for a while and then drive out from there. So remote work was something that we were doing way before COVID. When COVID happened, we at least tripled in size. At least at one point we hired on in a matter of one month, 23 people, because we took on a very large grant from a FEMA funded type of situation. Um, and we found that we could. So even though there's difficulties around hiring, we found that, you know, we could do that because we also were embracing this model of flexibility, accountability um, and measuring the goals that we were setting and how we were serving our community. So we weren't taking money, and not doing anything. Um, so that flexibility and those, those tools that we now use certainly still zoom. We do meet, uh, in different intervals, but I just recently hired uh, a grants manager, grants and communication manager. She lives between Mexico city and South Carolina. Would that have ever happened five years ago? Like it may have with us. It may have. Yeah. We we felt we felt that. We kind right. of felt that. But the big the big concern for me um from the beginning has been, but then I, I kept seeing it solved and solved and solved, was that I need a team. I want everyone to feel the trust with everyone else. I don't want anyone to feel like that grants and communications manager, she doesn't know what I do. How is she going to write me into that grant? She doesn't feel what I'm doing. Um, but we found that that was possible and not just through Zoom, but also through WhatsApp. We have a lot of sub groups and sub connecting points with WhatsApp so that it can be on a daily basis where we have a team out there and they're sending some pictures about what's going on. Like, Hey guys, what do you want to do with like. this? Here's what actually, yeah, while and you're not, writing that grant, here's yeah. what goes on. Exactly. But not everyone is connected to every, you know, WhatsApp group, right. but that connectivity, what we do during our team meetings uh, on zoom, when we get people together uh, and how we manage that is a very, very tight team. So that I've had a person, we had a GC at one point who was with us, but she wasn't out very often because we knew that was the way we were hiring her. People were in tears when she was moving on to another position uh, because there was a connection there. Um, so it was possible. So that's one piece of it. The other major resource I'll have to say is being able to be open enough to uh, accept other resources that at first sometimes feel like, oh God, this is another big conversation. You know, like I've got this, I've got to focus on, but now this thing, it's like a gift, but can I handle the gift? So I said yes. So I ended up going to SOMOS in Puerto Rico, which was a tremendous experience. Just went? Just came back. Oh, um, yeah. That's a little bit of a tan. Did, I have. did you meet the guy uh, from Queen's Chamber of Commerce? I probably did. Tom Gretz, a good friend of mine, and Brendan Levy. I probably did. I probably yeah. did. A lot of city folks, which is yeah. great. Some state folks, which is what it was there to really meet. But we took on uh, a pro bono um, support of Bolton St. John. So they're an organization that's taken us as a pro bono client. Um, and that's been huge because they are doing a lot of the connectivity between some of the folks that might help us get where we need to be. But those are resources that might show up that if, you're, if you've got your head down to the grindstone and you're not 
you know, sleeping enough and you're harried and you know what's going on, you, you sometimes you miss these gifts. So I think the resource there was very important for me to be able to say, yes, this is important. I'm going to make all those meetings happen. I'm going to be available to those folks. And it is paying off already. Thank you. That, that's awesome. Yeah. All right, well, Patrick, we're going to give you a double feature right now. It's like, it's like, oh, wow. We used to have a double feature when I was a kid. You pay for the movie once and then you'd see a second movie while you're in the theater. It was a little bit of, I don't know if it was legit, but. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to have you answer that question. Yeah. Right. And then we're going to do like a, I want literally, a, I want to get to our audience. Sure. Right? So I want you to answer the question about resources, follow that by best advice you ever received that's impacted your. Okay. Future. Yeah. So the resource is really a quick one. Uh, if you haven't heard of them, they're in this room. Pro Bono Partners, Judy Siegel back there. I mean, they've saved us hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees. Um, right now, they're working on our employee handbook. Uh, and, and I want to say, like, and, you know, if, if you're grassroots, if you're an organization that's started or any size, the handbook is so important because when you're in your nonprofit, you've got to be able to focus on your mission. And uh, if if you have to worry about things like handbooks or legal stuff, like that can detract you away. And it's also the kind of thing that could undo all your hard work and your integrity. So to not have to worry about that is, uh, is such a big deal because sometimes, and Dan, I'm sure you'll feel this too, like, you know, when you start something that's grassroots, it can feel like you've jumped off a cliff and you're building the airplane on the way down, you know, and uh, knowing that you have organizations like Pro Bono Partners who can help you put those pieces together that are legally sound massive um, so while, while we're doing that judy what is the cost to work with pro bono we're free we wait i didn't say it again <laughs> to over a thousand nonprofits in new york new jersey and connecticut what's your website it's horrible it's pro bono partner.org <laughs> pro bono partner singular pro bono partner.org right allison will you just send that out yeah it, it will be on the resource page from everybody yes we will share that that'll be after the passage and then give me, we're going to go advice. best piece of advice, and then we'll go. So pro bono part. No. Uh, uh, pro bono part? Yeah. <laughs> are you done? Answer. Yeah. I'm trying to keep, oh, I didn't keep it on air time. Air time. I'm looking at my panel, and I'm going, yeah. did I not yeah, air time? Right, air so time. advice. So uh, two things. One is is a, is a non profity one, which is, I learned early on when I first moved here, because I was probably a little bit uh, not New York enough to be in this space. But if you don't ask, the answer is always no. Yes. Uh, and everyone was like, you got to learn that, like, right away. Stop being so British. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Mouth, don't get fed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the maybe the more leadershipy one would be kind of a, a quote about like we suffer more in imagination than reality from uh, Seneca. I think we, we suffer. suffer more in imagination than reality. There's all these things that we picture that are going to go wrong. Right. Or we ask this person, they'll say no, and I'll be embarrassed, and I'll be laughed out the room, right. and they'll think my mission doesn't matter or it's going to fail. And a lot of those things you create. In fact, all of them are just most of them are absolutely Seneca, like Stoics. Is that what? Yeah, you're yeah, saying? yeah, yeah. It's just you know that I think of all the tragedies in my life. And the vast majority of them never happened, you know. And it's like yeah. that's <laughs> like that's it, you know. Vast majority of them never happened. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm that's my fortunate in that regard, I guess, because we tend to create a lot of shenanigans. Yeah, 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 yeah. And as leaders, particularly, but in, everyone in this room, you know, especially if you're mission focused, it can feel very tempting for people to be like, oh, this is more important, or, or mine's going to fail, or whatever it is. And and it's just it's just not true. And that story we tell ourselves is so powerful if we're not careful, you know. So. That's awesome. Thank you. So I have three um, three more contestants for this question. So um, <laughs> I'm picking a number between one and 10. Suzanne. Six. That's right. <laughs> you catch on. Best advice. <laughs> you know, she's paying attention. Uh, best advice you've ever received and, and what it's about. Um, never turn down an offer that has never not yet been made to you. Never turn down an offer, an offer that you've not received yet. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh the context was um I was talking to um sort of somebody who I look up to as a mentor when I was thinking about a job decision. And some of my thought process was around whether to even apply. And she was like, you haven't even been offered the job yet. Like, are you saying no to the thing that you haven't applied for? And it's a very real thing because I, to your point, I think there's a theme here. We talk ourselves out of opportunities yeah. sometimes yeah. Mm -hmm. and we don't put our name in the conversation. And if you don't do that, you don't even have the option. You can always say no after you get the mm -hmm. offer if it's not right for you. Um, you know, uh, um, 
there is some data about, you know, when people are applying for jobs and what women do, and sometimes in particular women of color, um, you know, a white man might have three of the 10 criteria and he's applying for that job. Mm -hmm. And I could have like nine out of the 10, but I'm like, okay, I don't know Excel, so I'm not gonna apply. Wow. And you can't do that. And um, I think for me personally, um, you know, in the past year, I kind of had that similar experience because I was very content as a general counsel of SEO. That was my dream. It's a, it's a, I was the head of the legal department. Yeah. And then there was a leadership change and the board said, do you want to be the interim? And I was like, I I'll get back to you. And then my friend was like, yes, you, the answer is yes. <laughs> and then I sort of said to them, I don't know if I'm going to like it, you know, so I'll think about it. And through that process of thinking about putting my hat in, I talked myself out of the job. And then I just had to like remind myself, don't turn on the offer that you have not yet been given. Put your name in. You can say no when you get the offer, but allow yourself to get the offer. That is so big. It, I, I have a couple of ideas and I just looked at my friend Allison because there's a couple of projects I have in my mind that I've been talking about for years. And I get in my own way and I talk yeah. myself out of these things and I never even got in the game but mm -hmm. I, you know that's it's critically important oh man so so great um I'm thinking of a number just go, <laughs> get it just go next <laughs> um I have two one is serious and one is kind of not serious but the first one was definitely just smile more. um early on I used to always like take everything personal and well, never smile to that so that really shifted just my presence in rooms the second has to do with fundraising again um, so I, as I mentioned, my parents were nonprofit and my father and mother would always argue and he would be like, I'm not begging people for anything. Uh, stop begging. It makes people hate you. My mother would always say, you're not asking for money for yourself. <clears throat> you're asking money for the mission. It's two different things. And so to me, that's become very important. I have to continually remind myself that because I don't like asking people for anything. And so as a nonprofit founder, you're constantly having to request fundraise or ask for money but it's not for you. It's literally for the mission. And if you're authentic and staying true to the mission, it actually becomes a lot more genuine. And people, again, can see right through that. Where is the money going? What programs are you doing? How is it impacting? What are the metrics? As long as you have all those aligned, the acts becomes very seamless, almost like at scale. So that's so great. Yeah. God, are we getting a lot from this panel or what? <laughs> Yeah, it's really just an infomercial. I make you all clap for like <laughs> random parts of the show. Set it and forget it. Um, <laughs> after Minerva answers this question, we're going to open it up to you all because I know you probably have great questions, better questions than I've even asked. So let's take it away, Minerva. Same thing. Um, best advice. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to I'm going to say two things really sure. quickly. Um, uh, one being, uh, I think, learning from other leaders and a lot of leader, a lot of women of color um, is to not kind of bury your personality to not bear it. I am silly. And even though I did work in domestic violence for a long time, that's a lot of time where I needed that silliness to kind of come out and uh, for the clients and the, and the survivors and also my team, but uh, do not bury who I am because suddenly being the serious person mm -hmm. means that that's how I'm, I'm getting things done. No, I mean, if we're not if we're not living and fighting and, and working towards joy, mm -hmm. uh, then why are we even doing any of this work? Mm -hmm. um, so to try to keep that in mind at all times, even when it is really, really difficult. Um, that's one. And the other piece is to relish being in spaces where I don't even know what the heck is going on. Wow. wow. Uh, so that I don't have to walk into a room and be an expert at even any of it. But if there's a reason that I think I'm drawn to that space to learn more about it, that it's OK that I'm there to give myself the permission to be there as a person who's going to learn a whole lot. It's going to ask some interesting questions. You can maybe roll your eyes type questions, um, but I'm going to be in that space and it's going to be real. And my intention is to really be there, not to just show that I'm there and be okay with that and relish that feeling of being uncomfortable and, and getting something into my DNA that wasn't there before. And uh, so I think those are two things. That's awesome. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. I tell my kids, I have a little flyer. Like I made it like, on the, I just printed it out and it says life begins at the end of your comfort zone. And I signed it, put it up next to my bed. It's been there. I gave it all my kids and my wife and they all crumpled them up like <laughs> years. Mine is still stuck there. It's not nice. It's just there, you know, in my bed. All right. Open it up to you all. And then I have other questions I could ask if, uh, well, I know you can have great questions, but if you run out of questions, I'll play again. All right. Raise your hand if you'd like to ask this esteemed panel about their leadership and the profile of a nonprofit leader. Yes, sir. 
who are you and, and what's your organization? Sure. Uh, my name is Osman Canales. I am the founder president of a new organization, Long Island Latino Association. And I have a hundred questions. Do you have time? Yeah. <laughs> Um, my, my question is, uh, and this is something that a question that I had before coming to the event, so I have to ask. Um, a lot of the grants available, as you know, are very limited, and there's a lot of competition, as you mentioned. Uh, for a new organization like mine, uh, what advice would you give? Anybody want to take it, just call it out, whoever wants to go. Yes, that guy. What's your mission? Mm. Always going to be streamlined to what is your mission, what is your programming? Yeah, and then you gotta. Uh, I, I always say it's very similar to. I don't know if everybody knows like procurement mm -hmm. and like getting contracts. A lot of people want to get MWB certified. They get certified, but they can't get any contracts. But their company has nothing to do with what people are looking for contracts for. So um, make sure that you know what, depending on what your mission is and your programming is, how is that going to align to getting grants? And if it's not, maybe possibly pivot. But again, staying true to your mission. Mission, but you're not just going to get grants just to be here. They're, they're not giving them money for free. Right. Thank you. Okay. That throws me out there. Um, and I've known Osman Canales for a number of years. He is a, a true leader uh, from doing your student alliance work uh, and then going to Alzheimer's and then now doing your own thing. I just congratulate you for, for your vision as well. Um, I think because you build good relationships, I know a little bit more about you, is that you know the some of those partnerships, I think there are ways of, of building partnerships, even on grants, that you don't have to lose everything. It doesn't have to be, oh, I don't have, a, I don't have, you know, I've got a very small budget right now. It doesn't mean that you don't, you might be bringing something else to the table, all of your connections, your background, the way that you know how things work, um, to not sell yourself short on that. But I think to start off with, um, even with our organization, starting off with smaller grants and doing some collaborations, doing some MOUs, uh, you know, do and then, but being a person, an organization to get money from that and not just settle for, oh, can I just have my name next to your name? It's like, no, you're worth more than that. But I think building it up like that is gonna be good and you have a tremendous amount to offer. Awesome. Yeah. Make sure you guys make sure you meet people in the room. Do some connecting. Yes. Um, Patrick, you want to jump Congratulations in? Congratulations on, on starting your own thing. It's, it's fantastic and, and brave. Uh, I, I would look at, uh, from just from my point of view, like diversifying revenue streams as much as you can, right? So we we really run a nonprofit, but it's a social enterprise, it's a business. 90% of our revenue is covered by sales. Uh, the only, the 10% is grants and fundraising. So if there's any way you can get earned income, and I've, I, I don't know your mission, but like if there's a way you can achieve some earned income through selling something, through providing a service, whatever it is, that's a great way to balance out some of the grant challenges or the fundraising challenges, which I think Ken said earlier is, is drying up for four years in a row, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think nonprofits would do well to as much as possible, look at other, like diversifying the revenue yeah. streams um, to protect against the unpredictability of we grants should, and donations. panel just on social enterprise and how that can, you know, because it's not just one check daddy. It's not just product. Right. It could be a service again, yeah. curriculum. It could be a program yep. out there. So God damn. Yeah, I was just going to say that's a great point because that's why I meant Osmond um, with, with your mission is our mission is civic education. And I was pounding, we weren't getting any grants. And then what kept coming out was workforce development. Mm -hmm. Where I'm like, workforce development, workforce development. So then I was like, well, we do have an entire community of young people and all these companies are looking to hire. We could help you recruit. Yeah. And then it became a natural recruiting contract that we were able to raise most of our money for. And then we are able to transition that into our civic education program. Yep. That's great. So, Suzette, you want to answer? I think questions? that you guys have handled it. Good. <laughs> Perfect. Just what I needed you to say. Another question from my audience. Who's got a question? I have one. So I can't pick you all. So, oh, Kelly Ann Serini. I think the workforce changing based on everything that happened remote, things like that, from a leader, what important things have you had to pivot during this time in order to be successful for your organization? Having to pivot because of the workforce changing yeah, relative to COVID, remote, remote. 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 All that, the you want to, how about that one for you? I'll take a stab at it. Um, yeah, I know. Um, so obviously um, the reliance on the technology, to be, if I'm being really candid, I am struggling with this a little bit because um, a lot of my services are direct care services and you right. can't work remotely right. with your direct yeah. care. Can't do that over Zoom. But then I also have a big administrative workforce and the landscape is changing. And if I tell everybody they have to come to the office every day, they're going to quit. Yeah. And so, and then I'm also saying that I'm an equitable, inclusive workspace. So my direct care workers are like, oh, so if you're like at the headquarters, you don't get to come in, that's not fair. So then I have to think about the fact that 
equity does not necessarily mean equal and it's a whole thing that goes down the chain. Uh -huh. In any event, um, I think it's a it's an evolving conversation because you always want to be fair to your workforce as an employee employer. Um, the reliance on technology is certainly very important. Um, but I think also creating space where there's that touch point in person. Um, so, for example, I encourage the admin people, go into the field and meet with the staff, the people who you're supporting, find out what they're doing, look at the clients, like, you know, get inspired, connect to what you're doing. Have a conversation with the people that exactly. are like, on the front line. Exactly. And I get them to do that because I do it, too. So I don't just say do it. And then I'm sitting in the office every single day as well. So just, you know, creating that space, um, you know, having, you know, occasionally a meeting that's in person um, where you're creating that touch point in person. But um, it's a real struggle. And if there are any great ideas, I'm definitely open to hearing them. And that's the thing about this, too, because it's all about the great ideas. I learned this a long time ago. The ideas are in the room. They're not just in my head or your head. They're in the room. So we need to communicate. We are. I'm being I feel like we're being hunted right here. I, I, I think something <laughs> she stood up. She has, hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait, wait, really quick. I, I know I'm about to we're about to send this off. Here's what I need. I didn't tell I didn't tell any of you I was going to do this, but as I write it down, you'll figure out what it is. Uh it could be leadership, it could be professional development. Just one second each. Best book recommendation for this crowd. Who wants to go first? Deep work. Deep work by Cal Newport. Carol? Cal. Cal, C A L? Yeah. Cal Newport. Newport. We don't have time for you to tell me about it, so we'll just have to listen to it or read it. Okay. Uh, Suzanne. I like, to, I might mess up the title Dare to Lead, Brene Brown. I think it's Dare Brene to Lead. Brene Brown. Oh, I hear a lot in the background. Dare, Dare to Lead. Yes. L E A D, Brene Brown. Uh, Minerva. Uh, the biography of Sonia Sotomayor. Uh, the biography of Sonia Sotomayor. <laughs> wow, great. And who do I leave out? Patrick. Uh, Songs of Significance by Seth Godin. Oh, Songs Just finished. of Significance. I don't know if anybody likes Audible, but I love Audible because I like people who read me stories. Songs of Significance. So think about that. Four individuals gave you four books. Take them home. Somebody try and take a picture. Let me get out of the way. Take a picture of those. Right? That was totally unplanned. I thought of it like, yeah, I thought of it like, <laughs> I thought of it like 45 seconds ago when, when Allison was trying to close the, <laughs> thank you. Can I please have some applause for my panel?